Thank you. It's certainly nice to be invited to this summit. Uh, there's great things in store for you, and I think uh, you're being assigned uh, quite a mission in this process. Uh, the numbers that uh, Director Moore went through and the, your response to the questions Wendy just asked indicate that everybody's obviously got a passionate interest in what's going on here. But where did that come from? You're here because you have a conservation ethic. You care. You care about wildlife. You understand what it takes to have wildlife. But if you look around the planet, there's not too many other places in the world where this can happen. I don't think they're having a wildlife conservation summit in China today anywhere. I've been in a whole number of other countries and the impression that I come away with in time is that this is a very unique relationship that evolved in this country. It wasn't on autopilot and the story about how it happened I think is so rich that I tell it frequently because I think uh, when I learned it and uh, continue to learn it, it really strengthens one's commitment and one's resolve and one's determination to spend time like you guys are spending it this evening. But when our country was put together, we had a Declaration of Independence, Constitution, and a Bill of Rights. Not one of them mentioned our relationship with wildlife, our relationship with the land. It was all about our relationship with one another. And it was extremely important in how we would govern ourselves. And so what our colonial predecessors knew is that uh, they knew the law of Europe, the law of England. And it was a little bit different. Uh, King Canute, for example, he prevented people from hunting on the king's land and the penalty was simple enough, it was death. William I, he enforced the laws based on the European code. And here's an example of that. Whoever shall kill a stag, a wild boar, or even a hare shall have his eyes torn out. So that's somewhat on the radical side. After the Magna Carta, they designed a new set of forest laws. And uh, pay attention to here to the language when the uh, aristocrats of Europe decided to soften things. They said, no man shall henceforth lose either life or member for killing our deer. But if any man be taken and convicted of taking our venison, he shall make a grievous fine if he hath anything whereof. So A, they weren't going to kill you. They defined you, but they really didn't expect you to have very much. Uh, but that was their uh, version or their way of relating to wildlife. So when our country was set up, we had to find a new way. And as I mentioned, our founding documents didn't give us any guidance. So it went, wound up in the, law, in the lapse of the court. One of the first cases brought to debate to discuss who or how we were going to relate to wildlife in this democracy was an argument over oysters in the New Jersey Meadowlands, of all places. A lot of you guys thought that was a football field was the mouth of the Raritan River, and the battle was over oysters. And what the U.S. Supreme Court eventually held was that when the revolution took place, the people of each state became themselves sovereign. And in that capacity, they were the ones that had the power, the right, the ownership in the uh, fish and wildlife resources. In, in that, that case started a whole series of U.S. Supreme Court cases, uh, one in, eight, that was 1842, so we were like 66 years old as a nation, and the court starts deciding that wildlife is going to belong here to the sovereigns and that the people were the sovereigns. In a more direct case in 1897, the language gets a little bit clearer, and then the court, Supreme Court ruled on a wildlife uh, case that wildlife was a trust for the benefit of all people, not as a prerogative for the advantage of the government as distinct from the people, or for the benefit of private individuals as distinguished from the public. And I think your 1938 Idaho Charter hits the nail right on the head, because it's just exactly in line with what the court ruled as far back as 1896. One historian uh, assesses the situation this way. He wrote, American citizens, not those who governed them, were sovereign. 
In the U.S., every adult enjoyed another right that only kings and aristocrats had held in earlier centuries, the right to hunt, the right to hunt and the right to make political choices, vote, emerged simultaneously in the U.S. And that gives you some kind of an idea through time how unique this relationship that we have with wildlife that uh, produced the numbers that Director Moore talked about and that Wendy just pull, pulled out of you. So where did this all come from? Uh, where did this American Commons come from and uh, how did hunters and anglers finally step up and uh, take the leadership really that restored wildlife to a continent that we had initially stripped? Because as these things were developing, we were also doing lots of other things out there in the land that weren't quite so uh, consistent. But whether or not history is important, I'd like to lean on two guys. One is Theodore Roosevelt. I lean on him a lot. He wrote, we have not too many monuments of the past. Let us keep every bit of association with that which is the highest and best of the past as a reminder to us equally of what we owe to those who have gone before and how we should show our appreciation. And of course here, those who have gone before, those people in 1938 and before who were doing things to make sure there was a resource here for you people to uh, enjoy and perpetuate. The other guy I lean on is Aldo Leopold, because we're all kind of his buddy. And Aldo said, to think straight on recreational quality and historical perspective is essential. So I think it's important that we reflect for a minute on our history and how we got to, to deal with the wildlife resource that we have out there today. And we're a pretty young place. We're like 236 years out from the Declaration of Independence. By way of comparison, the Roman Republic and Roman Empire lasted about 2,000 years before a portion was toppled by Odeker and later the remainder by the Ottoman Empire or Turks. But today we're gathered in Boise uh, to find ways for our relatively young republic to nurture and strengthen a, life, a lasting contra, cultural conservation ethic. The ethic we have has a fascinating history. And it is ethic that literally emerged from the boneyards of the late 19th century. It was an ethic so laden in the people and through our brief history brought to surface a significant part of who we are as a nation. The conservation ethic that brings us all together will soon be called upon to grow strong enough to respond to environmental challenges quite likely of global proportion. You are here in no small way to help chart that course. And I'm gonna use a little passage here because this is the only year in my life that I can use the passage that follows. And I use it to give you some kind of a perspective about how long we've been at this. And so I'm offering myself as a visual aid. Wendy was short one category, I'd be in category seven. <laughs> but I'm 77 years old. That means I was born in 1935. If you back that up, 77 years, you hit 1858, the birth year of Theodore Roosevelt. And if you backed it up one third person of 77 years age, you would hit what would be a 24 year old Indian warrior when Lewis and Clark crossed Lehigh Pass into Idaho. Now that's how long this culture, this society has been on this landscape and all the things we talk about and all the things we've been through happened in the lifespan of three individuals, less than the full lifespan of three individuals. So I think it gives you some kind of perspective, or should, that this is a work in progress. This isn't some permanent thing that we are trying to preserve. This is a work in progress of people in, in a democracy, free, to do whatever we please, working on establishing a relationship with nature and with one another. So what happened here when Lewis and Clark showed up? Well, that 24-year-old Indian, Indian, if he was sitting on Lehigh Pass, he might have 
seen Lewis and Clark crossing over. They did it on August 12th, 1805. And what uh, Captain Lewis writes at that moment, two miles below McNeil had stood with a foot on each side of a little rivulet, and that's on the, on the Montana side, and thanked his God that he had lived to bestride the mighty and heretofore deemed endless Missouri River. On the top of the ridge, I discovered immense ranges of high mountains to the west, with their tops partially covered with snow. I now descended the mountains to a handsome, running, bold, running creek of cold water, where I first tasted the water of the Columbia River. 200 years, 12 days ago, Idaho's first tourist scrambled over Lehmann Pass, and he was obviously impressed. Were we a nation then that had a conservation ethic? Well, there's little evidence of it. In fact, the Europeans were concerned a little bit about this evolving democracy going on. And so about 60 some years after we were working our way through this democratic institution, uh, the Frenchmen sent a guy over. And they sent uh, French noblemen over. And the problem the French was, were having was they were having their own revolution but they were having real difficulty finding a form of government to replace it. So they sent a guy over named Alexis de Tocqueville. And de Tocqueville studies democracy in America, publishes a book in 1835, and I found a very interesting passage in his writings. He wrote, in Europe, people talk a great deal of the wilds of America, but the Americans never think about them. They are insensible to the wonders of nature. Their eyes are fired with another sight. They march across wilds, clearing swamps, and turning the courses of rivers. Our nation at the time was 59 years old, and de Tocqueville saw us more or less attacking nature. And I think that was kind of a thing that persisted uh, for quite a while. It wasn't that we didn't have people that were trying to plead for a different and more sensible relationship. We had guys like Ralph Waldo Emerson that wrote uh, eloquently, Henry David Thoreau, we're all familiar with Walden Pond, George Perkins Marsh, who called for a much more sensitive relationship with nature. And these were kind of three oracles that preceded uh, us finding a conservation ethic. They wrote eloquently, they spoke eloquently, they talked and they preached, and they all died before Theodore Roosevelt shot his first buffalo. So where did this conservation epiphany come from? Where did the light finally get turned on in the American culture, amongst the American people, that made these things as important as the numbers that these two previous speakers have laid out for us tonight? So before we can appreciate the light of an issue, it's necessary to visit the darkness that normally precedes it. So I want to tell a little story of the darkness in forest management in America. And for those of you know, who know Vicki Renault of the Idaho Fish and Game Department, this story comes from where she grew up. And it's a place called Peshtigo, Wisconsin. And the lumbermen were assaulting the Great Lakes states with unrestrained vigor. The way they described it was that it was a limitless sea of pine put there by nature for the benefit of the people. They picked up no slash. They had so much sawdust they didn't know what to do with it. Various uses were found for the sawdust. They paved their streets with sawdust and they stuffed their mattresses with sawdust. In the early fall of 1871, fires were burning in about a 170-mile front that was basically from the border, Wisconsin's border with Upper Michigan and Packer Stadium down at Green Bay. It was 170 miles long, 70 miles deep. And on October 8, 1871, the year that Chicago burned, the same day that Chicago burned, the winds came up that October and lit up the Wisconsin forest. 70 miles deep, 170 miles long, 1,125 confirmed deaths, human deaths. People were incinerated. A more accurate estimate was put at 
a hundred and uh, at, at fifteen hundred. At the time, Gifford Pinchot, who would be the, become the nation's forester, was seven years old, and uh, Theodore Roosevelt was thirteen. The night that the Wisconsin wood let up, woods let up. But that was an example of how reckless and careless we were going through our forest resources at that time. A similar story for wildlife. In the period that separated the presidencies of Thomas Jefferson, who bought uh, the Louisiana Purchase in St. Louis and Clark West, and the presidency of Theodore Roosevelt, uh, who was our 26th president, was a hundred year period. And Liz, uh, biographer, historian Stephen Ambrose compared the two presidents, Jefferson our third, Roosevelt our 26th, so the two images we have up, two of the four images we have up on Mount Rushmore. But when uh, Stephen Ambrose compared them, he wrote this, there is as much contrast as comparison, their skills for example. Jefferson loved music and playing the violin, while T.R.'s principal hobby was rifles and hunting. When the summer of 1883 dawned, North Dakota had their last major buffalo uh, slaughter in August of that year. They shot about 10,000 buffalo. It was their last commercial slaughter. It was August of 1883. The next month, in September of 1883, a 24-year-old state legislator from New York State gets off the train at Little Missouri, North Dakota, and it's Theodore Roosevelt wanting to kill a buffalo. He'd gone west after years and years of fantasizing and reading and studying about the American front, vanishing frontier, and he goes out to try to find one buffalo. And so he writes this, he, he eventually finds one. He hunts for nine days before he finds a single remaining buffalo, and he shoots it. And so he writes to his wife, Alice Lee, who's back in New York expecting their first child, and he writes, on the ninth day it culminated. I crawled up to the edge not 30 yards from the great grim looking beast and sent a shot from the heavy rifle into him just behind the shoulder. The ball going straight clear through his body, he dropped dead before going 100 yards. With a thousand kisses for you, my own heart's darling, I'm your ever loving thee. So that's his account of his killing a buffalo, something he had a desire to do probably from, you know, for, through his entire youth. But here's another account of the very same buffalo. And this is coming from uh, uh, a book by a guy named Herman Hagedorn, and it's about the very same buffalo. Roosevelt, with all his maturity, was a good deal of a boy. And the Indian war dance he executed around the prostrate buffalo left nothing in the way of delight unexpressed. Joe, his guide, watched the performance open-mouthed. I never saw anyone so enthused in my life, he said in after days. Roosevelt, out of the gladness of his heart, then and there presented him with a hundred dollars, so there was another reason for Joe to be happy. And I have a little sidebar story to that. When I was writing the book, uh, Rifle in Hand, I was working with an illustrator. And the illustrator said, you know, there's a guy who comes in my shop and he brings me memorabilia from the Bull Moose party for framing. And I said, what's the guy's name? And he said, well, his name is Doug Ferris. Well, this was Joe Ferris. And so I came home and told my wife, I said, Gail, I gotta go find a guy named Doug Ferris. And she said, let me make the call and which surprised me, made the call, went out and found him in a Helena rest home, and it was Joe Ferris's grandson. And she wanted to make the call because he had been her next door neighbor for 10 years and they never shared the story. That does two things, that shows you how compressed this is. This isn't something from you know ancient history. This is something that is unfolding uh, uh, all around us, all the time. But that was T.R.'s first buffalo. 
He shoots a second buffalo in 1889 in Idaho. And if you compare it with his war dance around the 1883 buffalo, by 1889 he has a totally different perspective. And he writes, I gazed on these bison themselves part of the last remnant of a doomed and nearly vanished race. Few indeed are the men now who now or evermore shall have a chance of seeing the mightiest of American beasts in all its wild vigor, surrounded by the tremendous desolation of his far off mountain home. So that was quite contrasting between doing a war dance and it reflected a conservation epiphany that had occurred in Roosevelt. After the 1883 buffalo, he goes back to New York, his wife gives birth, and within a month of uh, giving birth, his wife and his mother both die in the same house on the same day. Roosevelt, totally devastated, goes back west to heal, to hunt, to ranch, and spends uh, an interesting period in his time, uh, of his time in the west, hunting and having a conservation epiphany. He leaves us a pretty stark account because he was a, a writer and he wrote about what he experienced. I mean, he was out there, he was literally hunting through the rotting carcasses of the great herds. And in 1885, he wrote of a ranchman who had made a journey to look for grazing land from basically Medora, North Dakota to the base of Glacier Park. <clears throat> Excuse me, it was described as a journey of a thousand miles. And then Roosevelt wrote, to use his own expression, during the whole distance he was never out of sight of a dead buffalo and never in sight of a live one. In a journey across the Montana Great Plains of a thousand miles. And so there was no evidence of much of a conservation ethic in the grassroots level of the American people at the time. Buffalo had become a commodity and the rules of commerce suited, uh, sealed their fate. And so that was a resource that Lewis and Clark described as an aggregation of wildlife that for number and variety exceeded anything the eye of man had ever looked upon. In the process of writing, Roosevelt made the acquaintance of George Bird Grinnell. George Bird Grinnell was then publishing Forest and Stream magazine. And I think when you're talking about what this summit is all about, with reaching out to a broader conservation community, Grinnell was an exceptional conservationist and he gives us quite a lesson because Grinnell uh, founded the American Ornithologist Union in 1883. Now that's the same year that T.R. shoots his first buffalo. He founds the Audubon Society in 1886, which becomes the National Audubon Society in 1905. He was the editor of Forest and Stream, as I mentioned. He's identified now as the father of American conservation, although we really don't see his name mentioned that, that often. And I think one of the most interesting things was that he was attached to Custer, Custer's expedition that went out in 1874. He was uh, scheduled to go with Custer in 1876, but he had a conflict, which was <laughs> kind of fortunate for everybody. <laughs> but he had hunted buffalo with the Pawnee Indians in 1872. So here's the guy who founds Audubon, and when TR has his conservation epiphany and forms a, a conservation club of hunters and adventurers for the restoration of big game, Grinnell is one of the founders of that, along with Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot. And that, of course, was the Boone and Crockett Club. And conservation ethic now is in the hands of a handful of intellectuals and relatively powerful people huddled up on the East Coast, formed the Boone and Crockett Club. One of the most significant things they do, in 1891, they attach a little rider to a, to a bill that allows the president to start setting aside conservation reserves. In other words, we were disposing of land. These guys said, that's probably not the best idea to just keep giving this stuff away. And so they put this little rider on. 
And to keep the story reasonably short, uh, Theodore Roosevelt winds up, uh, because of his penchant for reform, um, as the candidate, a uh, vice presidential candidate under uh, William McKinley. They put him there because he was reforming uh, things in New York State so fast that the state uh, party of his choice decided they had to um, bury the bastard was the words that they, they used. <laughs> they put him in at the vice president and he writes, this job's nothing but the fifth wheel to the coach. It's the road to nowhere but oblivion. And so they had sort of temporarily succeeded. And then an anarchist shoots William McKinley and all of a sudden the guy they buried is the president. The national party boss, a guy named Mark Hanna wrote, or remarked to a reporter, I told William McKinley it was a mistake to nominate that wild man. Now look, that damn cowboy is president of the United States. <laughs> see, they had political you know, misstatements then too. <laughs> if you see some familiarities here, some redundancies, uh, that's just simply the way it is. But the thing about Roosevelt, he, of course, was more than a cowboy. He was a conservationist, and he was under the influence of Pinchot and under the influence of George Bird Grinnell. And in his very first message to Congress, he talked about the conservation of natural resources to the problem and its relationship to the national welfare. And so, but he also wrote in his autobiography about the time he entered the presidency, he said, the relation of conservation of natural resources to the problems of national welfare and national efficiency had not yet dawned on the public mind. So it was held by a handful of guys, one of whom happened now to be the president, but it really hadn't gone down to the grassroots level in America. And that comment was just almost an exact reflection of what de Tocqueville saw in 1835 Here's Roosevelt in 1901 making a similar observation uh, 66 years later. But Roosevelt, of course, is a man of action. His first message to Congress uh, was on conservation of natural resources. And TR was taking aim. And of course, we live 100 years downrange from the things he was aiming at. And I think uh, this whole conference is part of uh, part of the process and we can certainly judge the accuracy of, that, of, of his name. But he lectured every group that would listen. He, he held seven national conferences on conservation. And being a man of action as well as a man, as a man of words, he started using that 1891 act called the Creative Act. Here it was in the hands of its, cre of his, of its creator. And he starts throwing like 190 million acres of land into the forest reserve system. In total, during his years, nine years of president, or eight years of presidency, or seven and a half actually, he sets aside 230 million acres for conservation. It was 9.9% of America as forest reserves, wildlife refuges, national monuments, parks, game ranges. It was a public estate equal in size to the states of Delaware, Pennsylvania, New York, and Texas combined. And when he had to run for office in 1904, the New York Sun, a conservative newspaper at the time, uh, wrote a very interesting editorial. And it started out by saying, he has ruled his party to a large extent against its will. And then there is the great statesmanlike movement for the conservation of our national resources into which Roosevelt energetically threw himself at a time when the nation as a whole knew not that we were ruining and bankrupting ourselves as fast as we can. Our forests have been destroyed, they must be restored, these questions are not of this day only or of this generation, they belong all to the future. And the editorial concluded by saying, what statesman in all history had done anything calling for so wide a view and for a purpose more lofty? 
He won the election of 1904 by the largest margin in American history up to that time. The people loved that president and he drove political allies and political en enemies simultaneously nuts while he was doing it. And so the robber, robber barons of that era became desperate. They had to do something to curtail TR and they passed a rider on an agricultural appropriations bill that terminated the, his authority to set aside any more forest lands in six western states, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Colorado. He had about a week to either sign or veto the bill. During that week, he had Gifford Pinchot bring him the documents to create national forests in those states. He then signed all those documents, and then he signed the bill prohibiting himself from ever doing it again. <laughs> it was 21 new national forests. It was 16 million acres. And in his autobiography, he addressed it. He said, I signed, he wrote, I signed the last proclamation a couple of days before by my signature that the bill became law. And when my friends of the special interests woke up, they discovered that 16 million acres of timberland had been saved for the people before the land grabbers could get at them. The opponents turned handsprings in their wrath and dire were their threats, but the threats could be not carried out and were really only a tribute to the efficiency of our action. <laughs> One guy, he does all that. They called, him, called them his midnight forests. In Idaho, you know them as Port, Port Nuff, Palouse, and parts of the Caribou, Big Hole, Cabinet, and Priest River forests in Idaho, some shared with Montana and some uh, in, in Idaho exclusively. Well, that was a pretty exciting time. That was sort of the first wave of conservation ethic coming down. The people loved it. And the, and the combat between the exploitive interests and the conservation interests, of course, was basically immediate. Um, and conservation moves quite well there. About 30 years later, we run into a really tough period of time. And I think it's important that we mention that because what TR did was wildlife and forests. Now, Coming up to the 1930s for the second wave, and that's some of the things that the director talked about and others. But the Federal Bureau of Soils issued this proclamation. They said, soil is the one indestructible, immutable asset that a nation possesses. This is the one resource that cannot be exhausted, that cannot be used up. And of course, we now know that, that is not true. When the nation hit the Dust Bowl of the 1930s, we were literally a nation on our back. We were dealing with the Great Economic Depression, not just a recession. Things dried out and the dust storms blew. And one of the most interesting, I find, was a dust storm in 1934. And it's described by an author named Timothy Egan as follows. Blew off the Great Plains central and northern plains. And he writes, in Chicago, 12 million dust, tons of dust fell on Chicago. New York, Washington, even the ships at sea 300 miles off the Atlantic coast were blanketed in brown. 1934, the, the continent was literally blowing to the sea. And in 1934, you remember George Bird Grinnell, the father of wildlife conservation, a guy who hunted buffalo with the Pawnee Indians in 1872? Well, in 1934, he was an invalid. He was living in an apartment on East 15th Street in New York City. It was the same Grinnell who chased buffalo with the Pawnee Indians. Now I have to use my imagination. But my imagination says he was breathing the same dust 
that blew through New York, New York City that he, the Indian ponies, and the buffalo had stirred 63 years prior. That was the plight of our nation. The only good news at that time is that we had another Roosevelt in the White House. This time it was Franklin, and Franklin began the conservation of soils. And so we wrote, Theodore went forest, wildlife. When Franklin gets his shot at it, he adds soils, and we had sort of the third leg to the stool. And he hires a guy named Hugh Bennett to lead the conservation of soils. Hugh Bennett writes, of all the countries of the world, we Americans have been the greatest destroyers of land of any race of people, barbaric or civilized. And he attributed what was happening to the stupendous ignorance of our people. Franklin Roosevelt in 1936 calls the first North American Wildlife Conference. It was a conference put together primarily by J. Norwood Ding Darling, who was the chief of his biological survey, and it was a conference that brought hunters together from all across the nation. Because that's the only conservation network there was. Hunting organization, rod and gun clubs, formed after uh, Theodore Roosevelt's encouragement. Franklin calls them all in and says, boys, if you want this stuff, you're going to have to do it. They formed the National Wildlife Federation in the wake of that conference. And they get the Pittman-Robertson Act through Congress in 93 days, from introduction to signature. Can you imagine today's Congress getting something that profound through in 90-some days? Well, Idaho's Mr. George Grebe was there. And then, of course, in the wake of that, Idaho already organized into a conservation council, changes their name to the Idaho Wildlife Federation, and begins uh, the campaign to form the commission that your, your director talked uh, about just recently. There had been some evidence of conservation ethic earlier, people trying but never having the infrastructure to get things done. Idaho's first, and I noticed on the display out in the parking lot, as early as 1864, happened to be the very same year that Montana's territorial legislature passed its first crack at trying to get conservation legislation, same year, 1864. To keep that year in perspective, that was 12 years before Custer died at the Little Bighorn. So the conservation ethic was sort of latent in the people. Theodore Roosevelt showed us it was okay, and then Franklin Roosevelt passed it back down to the people, and all of a sudden, here you guys are. But that's where you came from. And the more you know about the story, I think the more uh, confident you should feel and the more motivated you should feel to uh, do the work that you're assembled here for. Uh, another very interesting thing happened in, in Idaho when Idaho's group came together in 1938. They draft uh, a model law for the commission that you eventually put on the ballot and succeed at. But one lesson I derived when I read the names of the guys who did it, who did the drafting. <clears throat> one was Homer E. Martin, an attorney. He wrote it. He was assisted by Guy Maines, who was the Boise National Forest Supervisor at the time. R.G. Cole was one of them. He was the manager of the Idaho Automobile Association and president of the Idaho Wildlife Federation. Charles Kalish, who was a district judge. Dr. A.W. Weaver, a dentist. And Grant Ferry, a U.S. Forest Service engineer. And I think the lesson there, and maybe the lesson here, is that when the community and the conservation infrastructure agencies find a way to work together, remarkable things can be produced. That we are all allies trying to go to the same way. And so the people of this natural, or the natural resource management in, in Idaho found that key in 1938. And so we have cycles that seem to be reappearing at 30-year intervals. The 19th century close, it was T.R. and his associates for the top down. In the 30 years later, it was Franklin Roosevelt in the dirty 30s, and people rising up in the, in the are getting together. 
in the worst possible times economically and environmentally and finding a way to do good things. Another 30 years later, the Arabs embargoed our oil and we responded with Earth Day and a proliferation of conservation nonprofits uh, now committing themselves to preserving these amenity values that, uh, that when these polls show that are so important to you. And along the way, in early 90s, Montana convened a symposium on the North American hunting heritage, and it traveled around through the United States and Canada. And what it concluded was, for the hunting and fishing community, after reviewing the history of the movement, the symposium series basically came to two conclusions. One is we had to clean up our act, and the other was that if hunting and fishing and, and it did not continue to lead in the conservation reformations necessary that they would become irrelevant. And that's why this thing that you have gathered for is so important because the agencies, hunters and anglers to date have supported that's chosen to lead. And uh, that's very satisfying and I wish you all the luck in the world and thank you very much. <clears throat>